This week on Dialogue, education reform, the view from the trenches. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. I'm John Molesky. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. Now let's meet our guests. Paul LaRue is a history teacher at Washington High School in Washington Courthouse, Ohio. Paul and his students have received national attention for their work researching Civil War topics such as the Underground Railroad. Hugh Osborne is Senior Director at 21st Century Solutions. He's working with North Carolina educators on a, a teacher-powered program called Bright Idea, and we'll hear more about that later. Gary Rubenstein teaches math at Stuyvesant High School in Manhattan. He's written two books on education, and he's a nationally recognized blogger on that same subject. He blogs for teachforus.org. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us. Thank Thanks you for having us. I want to start, I was reading a, a recent blog of yours, Gary, and you, and you uh, raised the question of definitions. What do we mean by reform? So that's as good a place to start as any. Let's go through the panel and in the context of education reform, what are we talking about? Thanks. It's really important to define reform uh, in this modern day because 10 years ago, if you said reform, everyone agreed it meant some change to education that was intended to make it better. And 10 years ago, you could have different groups of reformers and they could disagree about what reforms they support, but they would recognize the other groups as still not satisfied with what's going on and wanting reform. About five or six years ago, a group of reformers sort of rose up, and they basically dubbed themselves the reformers. And they support an agenda uh, which is known sometimes as a uh, corporate reform movement based on schools competing with one another, schools getting shut down for not doing as well as other schools. Uh, teachers being evaluated on their standardized test scores, multiple choice, and maybe getting fired based on those. So they've defined themselves as the reformers, and everyone else is now an anti-reformer. And uh, it implies that the anti-reformers don't want any reform, but actually they, they do want reform. This is very, uh, it's a big problem because uh, when politicians have to make a decision and they think there's two choices, you can either be a reformer or anti-reformer, of course, you're going to pick uh, to be an anti-reformer. The anti-reformers are uh, include all these professors of education who spend their lives thinking about what reforms work. And the reformers, uh, many of them just have uh, been successful in business mm -hmm. and have no education experience. With us or against us. So, you know, that's, reform is a politically charged word in this town. It's attached to all kinds of things, tax reform, social security reform, entitlement reform. Uh, does, it, does it bring a baggage to the discussion on education that's counterproductive? From my viewpoint, it really does, because uh, reform to me and a lot of people means it's kind of like if you have a uh, corrupt government. Reforming the government kind of means going back to something that worked. I can't even in my circles use the term because everybody immediately said, corrects me and says, no, we don't want reform, we want transformation. Mm -hmm. So we don't want intra-paradigmatic reform, which is what the reformers are trying to do, and a lot of the status quoers, or whatever you want to call the anti-reformers, are also staying within the same paradigm. What the people I'm working with are trying to do is to bring an entirely new paradigm in and completely change the goals, the philosophy, the methods, the outcomes, everything about education. And it turns out to be it turns out that there's a very good model for that. The, what you might call the inf information technology revolution became the innovation revolution and the whole set of ways that people interact um, and what you might call creative productivity. Productivity meaning that it actually gets done what you want to get done, but it's all around creativity and that's what the 21st century is about. So to me, it's not reform, it's transformation and you really have to figure out how to, how to move to a completely new paradigm. Now, I looked it up in the dictionary, Paul, and reform is, to, it's a more literal word, reform, either as you, Hugh suggested, take it back to an original state or just change it. But as Gary suggested, we're talking about improving. Change doesn't necessarily definitionally indicate improvement, but in this, as a political movement, this is about making it better. 
And that's your profession they're talking about. Well, it needs to be better. It's interesting, and, and one of the voices that seems to be absent from the discussion sometimes are successful, experienced educators. And it almost seems as though the people that have dubbed themselves the reformers uh, are folks that are, you know, are, are out of education, haven't been in education, and it's not that there aren't lots of things that need done, but there's a lot of positive things that are happening, there are a lot of success stories, and yet we don't ever hear from the successful educators as, you know, they, they should have a seat at the table just like everybody else. Has, along those lines, has anyone, a, a reformer, ever come to you and said, hey, you're a successful uh, high school teacher? What do you think? Has it ever happened? No. What? <laughs> <laughs> Gary, ever happened to you? No, I've, I've <laughs> talked with and I have ongoing dialogues via email with reformers um, about some things. So they have Friendly asked dialogues? me things. Uh, yes, yes, because um, they kind of have all the power, so you have to be pretty, pretty friendly to, 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 keep it, <laughs> to keep it going. Force friendliness. <laughs> they have friendly asked me some, some, some things about like teacher quality, what, I, what I've observed. And when I tell them what I've observed, and it's the opposite of what they uh, think, they get kind of surprised and tell me that I'm, you know, <laughs> that I'm making it up. Well, let, let's spend some time uh, also defining the problem. What are we fixing? What, what needs to be fixed? Anybody can start. Well, I, I mean, it seems like there's always kind of a conflict between the need for accountability, you know, how do we motivate? Uh, just to use my community as an example, I live in a wonderful, we're a rural southern Ohio community. We have a countywide poverty rate of about 20%. We have a friend reduced lunch rate of about 50%. We have a great community, but we don't have a lot of resources. And yet, to give those same students the same access to technology and to, you know, all the, the best things, you know, it can be challenging. Accountability sounds punitive. In other words, it suggests people are currently not accountable. Do you interpret it that way? Oh, I can talk, yes, about that. So the two pillars of uh, the reform movement are choice and accountability. They've made some sort of a story where teachers are somehow walking around high-fiving each other in the hallway because we're not accountable <laughs> and we could, we could do anything, uh, anything we want. The fact is that teachers get evaluated by their principals. Principals know pretty accurately who the best teachers are, who the teachers who are struggling are, and try to help the struggling teachers. But what's happened is that accountability has come now to mean to use a computer to evaluate the teacher through something they call value-added metrics. This means that they take your standardized test scores from your students from a previous year, and then they take the new scores, and they try to figure out what your students, based on what they got before, including also what their attendance rate was and things like that, what they should get if they had an average teacher, and then they compare your score. Uh, what they get afterwards, what they got before, and you get, did you add value or did you lose value? In D.C., the company that creates and calculates the value add is called Mathematica Policy Research. In their report, uh, in one of their reports they've written for Department of Education, said that the error rate is 35 percent, and they cautioned the Department of Education to carefully consider this error rate when using these metrics for high-stakes decisions like firing and tenure. Um, DC uses it now for 50 percent of their uh, teacher evaluation. I believe they fully ignore the, the warning about uh, error rates. It, Hugh, if, if people are listening in and they're part of the reform movement, they're the reformers that you've identified, this sounds heretical, our, our discussion here, because we're dismissing things like choice and like accountability, which is driving the discussion. Well, first off, I don't dismiss accountability. I think accountability in any profession, any organization is absolutely How do you foremost. define it in this context? Well, how would I define it? Or for right now... How do you define In the context of an education reform discussion, what is accountability? Well, accountability in general means uh, figuring out the degree to which your goals are being met. And in, in order to have goals that make sense, they have to have some kind of behavior that's measurable. You've got to measure that and then, and then obviously look at the delta between where they are and, and, uh, and what your goals are. But the measurement tools can't have 33% error rates. Right, but, but you, almost all this discussion um, from my viewpoint and what I've learned in North Carolina, kind of jumps around the big issues and loses the possibility of a solution by the time you get down to these issues. Uh -huh. the, the reformers and, and that, that whole crew are missing, I believe, the most important facts about education 
and therefore when they're trying to to, to push very technocratic solutions, they're missing the fact that what, what we need is... What are the most is, important facts? Let's, go, let's well, go through them. Well, first off, you have to figure out what your goals are. Are they test scores? And despite lots of nice talk from a lot of the people on the reformer side, it really seems to come down to, to test scores. Cheap tests, not, not tests that are, that are uh, broadband, that would really measure things that might be, might be important. But I think there should be three goals at the high level of education. Hard skills, soft skills, and engagement. And hard skills, these are business terms, but I think they really apply. Hard skills you can measure, let's say for now, with, with standardized tests. They're not very good tests, and in the future they'll be much better. Soft skills are uh, life success skills. They're, can you collaborate, communication, uh, productivity skills, a lot of things that, aren't, that, that, that are not factually oriented or simple skill oriented. And then engagement, of course, or passion, some people would call it, is how deeply involved in school are your kids in learning, in collaborating, in building, in belonging, and all those things that the school community should provide. Right now, we don't look at that at all. We are in a hard skills only environment. And what Bright Idea does is to move that to a hard skills, soft skills, and passion environment. And all of those are specifically tied to methodology, part to the pedagogy, and to measurement. And that's, if you move to an environment like that, then you can't do things like bring in programs that are heavy, heavy test prep that might build up the hard skills, but the soft skills are crashing, mm -hmm. and engagement is crashing. And that's what's happening, in our, and that's why we're chasing our tails so much in education, I believe. And my guess is these guys agree with me on that. Saw some nodding, but we should find out. Uh, with, uh, what, agree, disagree with what Hugh just yeah, I, described? I, I think Hugh, and one of the things, I, uh, one of the, I think is a great term is the term engagement. Uh, I mean, as a, you know, I've been in a classroom, this is my 27th year, and I mean, that's the, you know, a lot of the materials and things will come and go, but a, a student who becomes a lifelong learner, getting them engaged in a process, I mean, that's, that's such a valuable, and that's, that's a skill or, a, you know, something that a student will have their entire life. The, this, uh, one more question about testing. I don't want to get too bogged down in it, but since it is such an important part of the discussion, what is testing currently measuring? I mean, you, you just mentioned that before we went on the air that Ohio has now instituted merit pay based on test scores. And uh, what, what is it one actually? One of the worst ideas ever, by the way. Well, that's what I want to find well, out. What is, it, measure, is it measuring how, a teacher, how well a teacher teaches? Is it measuring what a student learns? Is it mm -hmm. measuring the ability to teach to a test and then regurgitate? What, what are we actually finding out through that measurement? Ohio, since the early 90s, has done some kind of a standard, and they've changed forms several different times, but it's... It's always a content-driven, you know, uh, facts and figures. Uh, facts and figures. So there was writing in Ohio traditionally. There was uh, math, reading, social studies, science uh, were the key components, and then there were, you know, you had and you had to pass the test to graduate. Now they're changing that around, and this becomes now part of the the merit pay program is just coming down the road. But they they want to tie the scores, you know, to the schools, and it's. I mean, it's not wrong to have material that we agree on, you know, and that sort of thing, but it gets, you know, again, I, I come from a rural school district where we have to work very hard, you know, we're, we're certainly not in the same place as a, uh, maybe a wealthier suburban district in terms of those things, but the tests are the same for everybody, yeah. obviously. I can uh, speak from the point of view of a math teacher now. Math is has become, but it's also become half of how well a school is doing. They basically look at the math and the reading score. A multiple choice math question uh, you can teach to that test. You can teach kids to eliminate two choices, eliminate one choice, and then and then guess. And um, as someone who also helps students with like the SAT, there are some strategies, some test prep strategies where you can even narrow yourself down to one or two choices out of five without looking at the question. Literally, by looking at the five answer choices, learning some of the psychology of the test maker, you can you can game the test, and schools do, and they game the test in different ways. They, they can teach you the test. Some schools will actually cheat, um, and um, but those, those are the main ways of, uh, I guess the, the worst of all, though, is the teaching to the test. That's the biggest cheat of all, because you're cheating the students out of learning, out of real learning. Right, right. Let me, we've spent a lot of time defining problems and bounced around a bit. Let's now focus on what you think works. What are some solutions? And Hugh, let's begin with a little more about Bright Idea. How does this program work, and why do you think this is 
a solution to a problem. Well, the, the central notion of Bright Idea, um, which has been around for about 11 years and was created by Duke University in the state of North Carolina, and I had nothing to do with creating it. I'm, I've been a, an observer and a, a pro bono consultant to it, so I don't want to take any credit for right. it. But when I first heard about it, I said, aha, this is what the country is looking for. At least I thought it was. This is what the country should be looking for. And the reason for that is that um, the top 5% of teachers, which I'm sure both of these folks are very much in that, in that, uh, that um, um, group, the, other than that, teaching itself is not a creative profession in the sense that teachers bring their own creativity to it, but the way that they're taught, as I've observed anyhow, and the way that they're managed in schools with textbooks, pacing guides, scripts, etc., it's very much a profession that is right now over-engineered for people who can't necessarily do, do the work and, and, and uh, meet their end goals the way that they're trained. They could be trained to be very effective. And if you, if you make the process a creative process where they're responsible for creating broad-based, multi-spectrum educational experiences for their kids, like I said, not only hard skills, but soft skills and, uh, and passion as well, then the whole culture of the school changes the outcomes change, the attitudes of the teachers change, the job satisfaction of the teachers change, everything essentially changes. It's hard to do, it's a two to three year retraining of teachers, but getting that creative, making it a creative profession versus kind of a programmed trade is really what uh, the, the What sounds is. a lot different about it to me is it's not to say, deciding that teachers are the problem and let's get rid of the bad ones. It's saying we just need to work differently with this group saying of people. The solution is already the problem. Here. Let's fix teaching. Teaching, not teachers. Uh, Paul, I, I got to know you over the years through your extracurricular work. Is that the answer to being a great teacher? Do you have to take it outside the classroom and well, do things beyond the curriculum? Most of our work actually is done during my, you know, during the school day. One of the things that's been really successful for us is we've created some strong strategic partnerships. Um, Time Warner Cable with their STEM, Connect a Million Minds, the History Channel, and, and what it's done is it's provided us some resources. Uh, last year, uh, my students were able to use ground-penetrating radar in a local cemetery looking for a cast iron coffin of a Civil War veteran. Fantastic, creative. Now, how, how difficult <laughs> is that to do? You know, I mean, you've made it look easy in all these years in the classroom, but I don't think there are a lot of schools and individual teachers using ground-penetrating radar. Well, the, the, it, was, it was an amazing opportunity, and, and I know that my students, again, how much Civil War history they may or not remember, I know they'll remember the experience they had and the use of the technology, and it was, again, giving my students an opportunity to do something, to get out of the classroom and, and do some things. And again, this was done during the, during the school day, because I, I have a, run about 135 students through my classroom in the course of the day through five periods. So. Uh, but it, but it was a fantastic opportunity, and again, these partners, uh, again, Time Warner Cable and History Channel, you know, have kind of have been great supporters. And, How do you find the time to do these things? They, you know, you hear from a lot of teachers that they, because of the stress and the pressure of the next test and the standards of learning and all these things, that it's very difficult to find this creative space that you is describing. For me, that's the part that kind of keeps me sane. I mean, we all, you know, there's, you know, we all grade and we all do those, you know, all the things that we still move tables and chairs and all the other things that go with it. But, but it's that, you know, which I guess maybe ties into the creative part and, and it, it, it means the most to me and I think it probably means the most to my students. Mm -hmm. Gary, how do, I'm sorry. I just want to make point. the point. Sure. It's kind of an obvious point that's made by a lot of people, but if, if you help teachers really teach, and not forget about the test scores, but take the pressure off, they will come. You know, the, 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 the ability, the scores will come. The kids, the kids move up at you know, different rates for different kids. Um, teachers figure it out in different ways as you're going forward. But when you have three goals to go for, it's, it's a little more complex. But the three goals, again, hard skills, soft skills, and, and, and passion, they reinforce each other. And the teacher is not pressured for test scores at all. Because if you pressure almost anybody for any kind of result, they're going to go the other direction. And, and psychology has shown that again and again, which is why merit pay is such a bad idea. Not, not pay for performance. I'm all for ultimately ladders and there are all kinds of things that, 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 that work just fine. But saying test scores will determine how much money you make and therefore your sort of self-image, that doesn't work 
that doesn't work at all. Broadening it, relaxing a little bit, and, and letting teachers really find their, their rhythm within a structured framework. I'm not saying everybody go off and wander through the daisies, but within a very structured framework over a couple of years, you really learn how to teach. The relief on the teachers' faces and in their hearts is incredible. Oh my gosh, I can finally do this. Gary, this is like a job interview where humility is not a virtue. We want you to tell us what makes you a great teacher. <laughs> well, I hope I'm a great teacher. I've been honing my craft for, for a lot of years. Um, well, for one thing, I definitely don't teach to the test. I try to make kids get excited about, about math. That sometimes means uh, focusing on something that wasn't even in the curriculum, something that they're not going to be tested on, but something that I think bridges the, the gap between sort of the theory and reality and, and try to make it, uh, make it fun. I, I wanted to, th there was a point about what solutions there are and one big thing, and this is part of what he was saying, because uh, the resources, we, a lot of uh, schools want to claim that with the same resources and the same kids in the same poverty, they're getting these miraculous test results. But when you really dig deep into them, you find they didn't have the same resources. They had private funding that was helping them. Or they didn't have the same poverty because they were somehow kicking kids out in different, in different ways. Or they weren't really getting the test scores. They were doing some games with that. The system was not designed for schools to overcome all the effects of poverty. 22% uh, of children are living in poverty. 39% of black children are living in poverty. So schools can't do that without the right resources. If you gave a massive amount of resources for programs like yours and things like that, you could actually close the achievement gap in that way, but it might be too much money for us to afford. I'm talking extreme level, class sizes of four students. It might can be I, too much. Can I disagree yes. with that slightly? Sure. Because it turns out one of the things that they found in Bright Idea is that the biggest factor by far is really the teaching method, which does require the resources to retrain the teachers. But they found that class sizes can go up somewhat. And the level, and this is very important because we have these common core standards coming along, which are actually more broader standards, more difficult standards than the ones that we have right now, that the level of performance of the kids also goes up. So you can, I believe, without massive increases of resources by doing the right kinds of things and being smart about it, you can, in fact, meet all the requirements that are people are putting on public education today. And it, that's, to me, sort of the tragedy of the situation because it can be done, but not the way that we're trying to do it, we're trying to do it now. I think it depends how high you're going to define your success. If your success, like No Child Left Behind, is having 100 percent proficiency for everybody by the year 2014, that's not going to happen. There's, there's some level that is a reasonable amount and there's disagreement about, about what it is. As far as class size, I mean, massive money doesn't necessarily mean small class size, but right. uh, small class size, imagine everyone, you know, four students, you know, you would be able to, to do something. That's not the necessarily best, uh, best use of money. But teachers, um, if, if a student's not coming to school because they're in poverty, if they're, uh, if they're, if they're unhealthy, there's different things that a teacher can't be held uh, accountable for. There's also, and I know you'll agree with this, the wraparound services. Some of the most high-performing schools invest money in mental health services for the kids, mental health services for the families. Um, we all agree that free lunch, reduced lunch is a good thing. That helps kids be ready to learn. Checking and vision. Somebody, so that checking so vision. A lot of these kids can't see the board and we don't know it. You know, we had a discussion here at the Wilson Center earlier today about the global financial crisis with the new IMF chief, Christine Lagarde. And, and one of the things that we talked about, I'm having a, a, a fla deja vu flash because it relates to this. And the question is, and maybe this is the final answer for each of you because we are tight on time. And the question is, do we know what to do? Is there agreement technically on what works? And or is it a matter of uh, political will? In other words, is it a technical issue? We're not sure about what works, or is it a political issue? We kind of know what works, but we don't have the political will, or we have too many meddlers who really aren't educators. Which? What do you see it as the most when we talk about education reform, Paul? Quick uh, thought. Again, from from my perspective, I I think I, I'm not sure that we know. We know a lot of things that work, Q. I mean, there's, there's great things that work, but I don't think there's a consensus. So there is a disagreement, or it's a technical problem. I, I think it's a technical problem, but at the same time, I, I feel like many times the some of the successful professional educators 
aren't at the table when these things are being talked about, and so programs like Hughes can't be champion, you know, other, other things like that. So I, I think we need to keep, again, the, the voice, and that's what I think is great about this panel. And, and is there a political problem as well? Is there, are there too many people who aren't educators or who are involved in education reform who are really politicians who have a different yeah. agenda? Is, is that also that, part of the mix? That's, that's part of the problem. They want it too fast. His program <laughs> is, um, is uh, probably getting incremental gains and in, in building things up, and politicians want them so fast that they don't want things that are based on research. You're, right. It's all based on research. They want things that are based on this business model, and it hasn't been proved to work with research. So res the stuff that research shows makes gains in a nice, steady way, kind of like weight loss. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens slowly, and politicians don't have the... Uh, the patient sometimes to no reason to, to get kind. personal here Gary <laughs> <laughs> I just, the, the analogy I use I think education today is like aviation right before the Wright brothers remember all those <laughs> those films of people jumping off cliffs <laughs> with duck wings and that thing that goes, <laughs> you know, et cetera. nobody understands the, the at, at a wide level understands the fundamental principles that are going to get us where we need to go what's missing is and this is essentially saying it's largely a technical issue what's missing is the model Mm -hmm. Not that there can only be one, but there there's, can only be one in that class that says if a district takes on this model, they will get to where they want to go if they have the willpower and a little bit of now, motivation. You know, in Ohio, as an example, we you know where the budget's very tight right now. Those kind of the monies to do some of those things is is tough. Well, uh, maybe it's appropriate that in this day and age we end uh, with a statement about uh, lack of resources because it seems to be a global problem. But gentlemen, no, no lack of good ideas. Thanks for joining us today. It was very interesting, and I sincerely wish we had more time, but we are out. Uh, we'll return next week with another edition of Dialogue. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Radio and Television. Our host Twitter feed is twitter.com slash John Malevsky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.